Yeah, I kind of missed it. I was back up in Philly uh, a couple of weeks ago visiting family. Yeah. Um, but as we mentioned, it was kind of cold and rainy then. It's not much yeah. different than down here right now. So. Yeah, I was going to say. It's <laughs> <laughs> it was like going up there, spending time with family, but still being by a fire yeah, under yeah, yeah. You know, blankets. So. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, we are live. I'd like to welcome everybody back uh, to Alabama Care Weekly episode. And I am here with Mrs. Nancy Anderson. And Mrs. Anderson is uh, Assistant Director of the Alabama Disabilities Advocacy Program, um, kind of shortened as ADAP. And within uh, ADAP, one of her main responsibilities is Chair of the uh, Children's we just said advocacy, advocacy team. team. Um, so I'd like to kind of hand it over now and let you introduce yourself and kind of some of the work that you do. Okay. Um, so I am... Um, as you said, the associate director, and I also chair our children's advocacy team. Um, but broadly, what ADAP is, um, is the um, protection and advocacy agency for people with disabilities here in Alabama. We are one of 57 in the country. We're all federally funded. Mm -hmm. um, and our mission is to protect and promote the rights of people with disabilities. Um, we are housed here in Tuscaloosa. We also have an office in Montgomery, uh, but we serve people statewide. Okay. We do a lot of road trips throughout the state. Um, we have, I've probably lost count, seven or eight, I guess, different funding streams which empower us to do different kinds of work on mm -hmm. behalf of people with disabilities. So some of our funding streams are specifically on behalf of certain types of disabilities, whether it's a developmental disability or a mental illness um, or a traumatic brain injury. But then some of our funding streams um, allow us to do particular kinds of advocacy. So we have one funding stream devoted to um, furthering the use of assistive technology in the state. Mm -hmm. And we have one, um, uh, actually we have two from the Social Security Administration, which um, one deals with um, encouraging and taking away barriers to employment for persons who are on SSI okay. or SSDI. And then the other Social Security um, Administration funding stream is a relatively new one, and it's our representative payee program. And that is all about essentially preventing the financial exploitation of people who are beneficiaries of Social Security, whether they get SSI or SSDI. Now, I'd like to ask you a quick question. A lot of, I hear SSI and SSDI. What is the difference between SSI and SSDI? So real quickly, um, SSI is Supplemental Security Income, um, and SSDI is dis essentially disability insurance. So anyone who, pay, who works and pays into Social Security, if they be, um, become disabled, Mm. Um, could potentially qualify for SSDI. Gotcha. So SSI means that you maybe not have worked before and you haven't contributed to Social Security, where SSDI is you have contributed, and if you do um, have a disability during that period, that would be what you would get reimbursed kind of thing. If, if you were deemed eligible for it, yeah. So a lot of recipients of Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, are actually children mm. who have a qualifying disability, which impedes their you know, functioning in some way or another. They obviously have never worked. Um, so that's a different program. Mm -hmm. But the goal behind um, the one program we have um, is you know, people who are on SSI or SSDI aren't necessarily working or they're not working to their fullest. And so the goal is to um, encourage either going to work or returning to work. Um, and then therefore getting the people off SSI or SSDI. Mm -hmm. You had to be contributing and taxpaying citizens. Exactly. And it's good for, uh, you know, it's good for everyone to work. It's not good to, you know, if you're able to, it's good to have something that you feel proud of that you create during that day, whatever that is, mm -hmm. um, and come home at night knowing that you contributed to society at large. Yeah, and I think there's certainly, um, with young people growing up today, um, and I'm sure a lot of advocacy groups that work with, families of younger persons, um, they grew, grew up with the mindset that their child, despite having a disability, is going to work. Yeah. 
I mean, there are jobs out there. Absolutely. And yeah. I, we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, uh, the owner of Tzatziki's uh, Mediterranean Restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about how, as a, an individual or a family, uh, you need to reach out to the business owners on a one-on-one -on -one, you know, um, um, relationship there. Because a lot of these bigger organizations, there's just so many things that you have to do and so many people that make the decision on whether or not to hire you or not. Mm -hmm. So he said kind of what I understood was, get in contact with your local business that you enjoy being a customer of and really reach out to the owner or the person that can make that decision. Um, so he's, he's doing a lot of really cool things I, there. That makes a lot of sense. And certainly when we work with families of young people um, who are getting ready to graduate high school, um, we often say to them, you know, yes, the school has a role to play in finding your child vocational or employment development sites mm -hmm. where your child could learn job skills, etc. But don't ignore the role you can play mm -hmm. in finding places as well. Mm -hmm. You have to be active there. And, but yes. the, the energy that you spend and the commitment that you spend early pays off long term. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really, I have a question about the representative pay. You said that's a program there. Mm -hmm. I recently became representative pay for a family member of mine. Mm -hmm. And that was a couple months ago. She has yet to receive her social security. It's like on backlog. Um, this is going on the third month now, so I have to go down to the Social Security office tomorrow uh, and, interesting. and kind of knock on the door and say, hey, what's going on? Because she's able to um, be okay without it for right now, but I know a lot of people wouldn't And the third month if they didn't get their Social Security. That would be a huge thing for them. Um, so, And, and long term, uh, my family member wouldn't be able to live without her Social Security. So, right. What is the representative payee program that you were speaking about? So, as I said, it's our newest funding stream, and um, it, it it's not just for us. The whole PNA network um, is part of this program. So, as a representative payee, you yourself know that you have certain obligations um, by way of using. Uh, your relative's money mm -hmm. in certain ways to further her well-being and you know that you have certain accounting responsibilities um, for how the money is accounted for and, and, and how you you know do the books etc. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately although it is the case that probably the vast majority of representative payees who are caring for the funds of a person with a disability they're probably doing it perfectly fine and they are doing it to further the interests of the, of the person and they're doing the accounting properly. There are some, unfortunately, who are not. Mm -hmm. um, and so the representative payee program is a way for the P&A system to identify those representative payees who are not doing it correctly, mm -hmm. who aren't using the money to further the needs of their relative or, or the beneficiary, whether it's a relative or not, um, or whether they're, um, not doing the accounting properly. So to help them, to kind of train them, that, hey, these are the best practices with people that are doing the job of being a representative payee, this is how you should go about doing it. If you don't, we're Well, it, it, and, and I, have, I have to be very clear in saying that it's a relatively new program, mm -hmm. so I am going to be very modest in what I say about it. Um, so we went over a little bit about uh, what ADAP is and is federally funded through a couple different programs there, and one of the big things that I think is really cool about ADAP and being in, in each state mm -hmm. is that it doesn't represent the state, it represents the people. Mm -hmm. And I think being federally funded allows that to happen, kind of make sure the state is doing what they need to be doing and what they need to do to serve people with disabilities. And I think that's something that is really cool. Do you know when ADAP first came about or well, how that? So the whole network, the whole P Protection and Advocacy, or PNA system, came about in the mid-70s. Um, and the very first funding stream was to advocate specifically on behalf of persons with developmental disabilities. Uh, and then after that, persons with mental illness were added on through another funding stream. And then after that, there was a, a third funding stream that essentially says, sweep in area everybody else, any other kind of disability. Um, but it came about, unfortunately, because, or the whole PNA system came about, unfortunately, because of the very gross abuse and neglect that people with disabilities were experiencing when they were in state care. Like institutions, you mean? When they were in institutions, yeah. So essentially, the 
Congress said, we're going to create this watchdog group mm -hmm. um, to make sure that you, the states, are doing what you should be doing on behalf of these people when they are in your care. So early on in the history of the Protection and Advocacy System, it was very institution or facility driven mm -hmm. because unfortunately back in the mid-70s, that's where people with disabilities were. It just wasn't f far enough along where you see this community living. Right. And so now time has gone by, time has gone by, and more and more people obviously with disabilities are out in the community. And in fact, in Alabama, we don't even have any more facilities for people with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, even though we do a tremendous amount of advocacy out in the community and um, protecting the civil rights of people with disabilities and protecting them from abuse and neglect, we still have that facility um, and abuse and neglect focus that that is undergirding our work mm -hmm. because there are in fact people with disabilities or mental illness for instance still living in facilities there are um, you mentioned a little bit ago your story about somebody living in a group home mm -hmm. um, we would be um, able to go in and protect a person who had been um, potentially abused or neglected in a group home mm -hmm. so that abuse and neglect um, framework that started off the PNA system is still there even though our work has gone on to um, more diverse areas of disability rights protection. Mm -hmm. Different environments there. Different environments, different issues. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one of our funding streams, I was talking earlier about our, our funding streams, one of them is uh, to protect the right to vote, hmm. and to ensure access to the right to vote um, for people with disabilities. Didn't have that back in the mid-70s when the protection and advocacy system started. Yeah. For my family member, their, my, uh, their vote is restricted. They're not able to vote. Do you see that a lot? Do they, is there literally in the order identifying um, like judge you as guardian? Well, it was before I was guardian. It was okay. already mandated at that point. Um, the um, I would encourage you to contact our office to do an intake to talk about that issue yeah. um, because one thing we want to do is secure the right to vote for people with disabilities absent a specific finding that they cannot vote and sometimes people think there's a specific finding when in fact there isn't what would be in a circumstance where you you would see a finding where you could not vote um, You don't you see many what, of them. Or you mean what it, what, what it is that would drive a person or, or would um, have like, a judge levy that kind of order? Where it would say, yeah, I think it is appropriate for the guardian, if they want to, to say that um, the person that they're a guardian for doesn't have the right to vote, to restrict mm -hmm. the right. Well, it's not, it's not up to the guardian, it's up to the judge. The judge. The judge to, to, to do that. So I would encourage anybody who is concerned, as maybe you are, mm -hmm about your relative's right to vote to contact us and talk with the voting expert because I'm not a voting expert. Okay. Um, let's get a little bit into the children's advocacy team then. So that is something okay. that you're chair of here in mm -hmm. ADAP. And was that something that you took on when you first became a part of ADAP, when you first joined ADAP, or did you kind of grow into that role? No, I've always done primarily children's advocacy. Okay. And what age group is that specifically? Well, birth. Um, and then anywhere, it taps out anywhere 18, 19, 20, 21, depending on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it gets a little um, <coughs> squidgy, I guess you'd say, at the top end because it depends on the um, service delivery system that we're concerned with. So for instance, if you're talking about uh, access to Medicaid services for children, children's Medicaid lasts till 21. Okay. So if you're contacting us about a children's Medicaid matter, it's going to stay with us on the children's team. But if you are calling about a 19-year-old who has a mental illness um, and is having issues receiving appropriate mental health services, when a young person turns 19, they're transitioning over to the adult mental health system. That's the way the state of Alabama's mental health delivery system is structured. I thought it was 21 or when you graduated your 
your, um, when you graduated high school? What they're that's that's for schooling. Okay. That's that's a different matter. But in terms of if you're if you're a, a patient um, receiving mental health services from the state of Alabama, and you're going to one of the local community mental health centers, you're going to be considered a child up to about the age of 19. Okay. And then after that, you've kind of moved into the adult serving system. Now it's it's they have they think transition. They don't do a hard um, stop and start. A hard stop and start. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, so just like um, the mental health system will look at a patient and say, oh, we're going to keep him over here, or serve him by, with these people, or we're going to move him over, we kind of do the same way. We try to figure out where, where it makes most sense in our office to house that case. Mm. Um, if, it's, if, the, if the young person is still receiving services through the children's side, even though he's at that funny age, then we're going because we're most familiar with the children's side, mm -hmm. whereas opposed uh, uh, to the, if yeah. he's on the adult side of the mental health system, we're going to uh, assign him to the adult team. Gotcha. Okay. What um, I feel like that is a very critical point uh, for the, the individual and the family is that transition out of the education system into the adult system. How early? Uh, let's say someone's transitioning at 19. When do you start to plan for that? When is, is it two years is really that, hey, we need to start doing this right now? And I know you're working with them through that entire time, but is there a specific one year, two year thing where you say we need to really put pen to paper and figure out what's going on here? Okay, so some hard data. Um, the, a child's entitlement to special education services lasts until he is 21 or until he graduate school with a regular diploma mm. um, it is another hard fact is that under federal and state law transition planning has to start taking place at the age of 16 16 or earlier mm. if the child's needs require it to be done earlier now it used to be interestingly enough that federal law said 14 and I don't even remember how many years ago now, maybe, I guess it was when the IDEA was reauthorized in 2004, although I might be wrong about that. The age was raised from 14 to 16, which anybody who knows anything about transition must have scratched their heads and thought, oh, well, well, that's dumb, you're going backwards. <laughs> exactly. Um, because if anything, you should be doing it earlier. Um, but there is that out in the law where it says 16, no later than 16, you must do it then or earlier. Um, we encourage parents to start thinking about transition at the very least by middle school mm. because for some children, particularly those with significant disabilities, you need that amount of time to really kind of lay out a plan and for your child to lay out a plan for where he, she wants her life to go. Well, I remember in ninth grade, we took tests that says, what do you want to do when you get older? Or this is yeah. what you're, you know, so it's right around that same age group. Yeah, yeah. You know, starting out there. And the transition plan, is that initiated by the school system? It's part of a, um, a chi it's the child's IEP, his individualized education plan, yeah. Okay. Um, and so if you are 16 years old, and still in the education system, or if your son or daughter is 16 years old and you haven't started your transition plan, you need to do that right now. It's your school's obligation. This should have been done before. Yes. So if you're, you're falling in that category, this is something that you need to get on right away and you need to speak with, would it be a, uh, the IEP team um, leader? Would that usually a special education teacher? Um, so our recommendation when parents um, correspond or contact um, their school district about any kind of special education matter is to go to the special ed coordinator, um, get to know that person. Uh, you can contact the building principal, you can contact your child's special ed teacher, you can contact your child's case manager. Um, but always make sure the special ed coordinator knows who you are and, and go through that person because she or he is honestly the most um, like well versed with well -versed, everything. Well versed, exactly. Yeah, that's going no, on there. Absolutely. And they can kind of pull some resources for the different questions that you have. Yeah. Um, I've spoken with a few families that have gone through that transition or are going through that transition plan, and if that 
is not done well, it causes a lot of stress for the individual and the family to the point where if someone needs full-time care or help and they stop receiving those services from the education department or, or from the school, like they stop going to school during the day, and there's nowhere for them to go during the day after that transition plan, then the family kind of has to take some time off to cover that until that solution's found out. Mm -hmm. And I've run into families where that's happened before, and I think that that can be eliminated by planning a little bit better ahead of time. But there are also instances where, you know, there's 3,000 people on the waiting list, and all of these services don't transition over very nicely. You know, it's a difference there between the young adulthood services and some of the adult services. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to somebody that is in that part right now where their son or daughter or they are out of the school system and things haven't clicked on the adult side yet? Well, it, hmm. uh, that's a pretty broad question because it depends on the nature of the young person's needs. Very true. Um, if the young person wants to go to work, and as we discussed earlier, should be but if you were we willing would, we would, and, yeah and i mean capable. it we would want work to be a natural outcome for any adult um and but if that if that young person has left the school system the next obvious stop for that young person would be to go to their local vocational rehabilitation office and seek help from that office mm -hmm. um if the young person needs help with independent living um there are a lot of different agencies that they can go to um, the um, could they call you if they were stuck in that transition like they had a plan in high school and then it kind of fell apart or needs changed would that be someone that would call you and ADAP and say hey we need a little bit more help with this plan so what we um, a lot of parents think that we provide direct services or that we case manage mm. and we don't do that we okay. fix legal problems mm. um, so if a parent called me and said, my child graduated from high school last year, he's sitting at home on the sofa, what do I do? Um, we would try to figure out where, if any place, that young person could receive some kind of service, figure out, you know, give advice to the parent about how to get connected to that service, and hopefully that information would propel the, the family and the parent on a good road and then if they ran into a roadblock they could call us back yeah um, and, and I think that that reflects one important thing about ADAP services we have a staff of 10 advocates 10 or 11 attorneys um, and then five support staff um, it would be very hard for you guys to do casework it, it would be very hard for us to turn every phone call that comes into our office into a legal case mm. where we're representing a person. And so when someone calls us for help, the very first thing that we want to do with them is empower them to be good self-advocates, mm -hmm. to give them the knowledge that they need to the legal, or the, the, legal substantive knowledge you know what what is the situation that you're facing this is what you can potentially seek this is what the law provides so give them the substantive knowledge they need and then give them advocacy strategies so they can go out and self-advocate mm -hmm. um, because we can't meet the needs of every single person that calls us by representing them in some kind of matter yeah and that self-advocacy we had susan ellis and allison haynes of people first on mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago and so I imagine that would be an organization that you would encourage them to be in touch with for self-empowerment and self-advocacy. In fact, we very often when we're talking to, again, on the children's side of the house, when we're talking about families um, empowering their youth, one of the things we do is suggest, you know, get your youth involved in some self-advocacy groups like, for instance, People First. Mm -hmm. We also make a lot of referrals, for instance, to Full Life Ahead, trying to help families uh, get hooked into that organization because of the way it's so empowering for them and for their young people. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, 
I was going to say, they did a little bit more casework, I think, um, than legal work there, Full Life Ahead does, more one-on-one -on -one with the family, mm -hmm. um, a little bit long-term. So it's a very good partnership there yeah. that you and, and um, Full Life Ahead and, and People First have. So that's very cool. Now, you mentioned that your work, uh, well, or I just had somebody upstairs in your offices mention that nearly half of the calls that come into ADAPT are for, are for child services, mm -hmm. are for, um, for the children, children's advocacy team. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's quite a bit right there. I imagine your plate is very full. With the transition in the IEP there, where do you see, where do you kind of let go and allow the adult, to, the adult programs to take over? Would that be like as soon as they are, um, so let's say it's community living, do you follow them for a few months after they Oh, I think I see what you mean. You mean if we if we become involved in some sort of matter, mm -hmm. and um, let's say we have direct involvement, and we help fix a problem, do we like hold the case open and watch to yeah, see if it worked I, out? Yeah. Um, we probably do more often than we should. Yeah. Um, what we really should do is close it promptly, and advise the, the family member that um, this is the path and this is the plan. Call us back if something goes awry. Um, we tend to probably keep them open a little bit longer than we should and just kind of call up every once in a while and say, what's it, you know, how are things going, um, and then close it. Mm -hmm. But we don't keep cases open forever mm -hmm. um, because a parent can always call us back again. Yeah, and that would just reopen the case. And yeah, then you, yeah. Then you know, it, it, work then, you know, part that for a week or a month, however right. that long, and then the case would be closed there. Um, one of the things that uh, the children's advocacy team has on the website is individual system and outreach. There's kind of three big areas that mm -hmm. um, you work on. And I had a question about system there. Are there things that you see on a national level um, that are some system changes that are going on that you think are gonna come to fruition and be very beneficial for the community? On the national level or the state level? I guess both. Are there any new programs or new guidelines that are coming out that um, you think are gonna make a big difference? Um, well, so a few things that I'm trying to pay attention to um, is the um, charter school movement okay which has gotten um, uh, you know some push at the national level and mm -hmm. then also some push at the state level and so what is the impact going to be on the education of children with disabilities in Alabama's very very new and right now very very small but nonetheless growing charter school movement um, so that would be one thing. Now, are they held to the same guidelines and responsibilities as a normal public and private school? The way they're the way um, the way they're set up in Alabama, they are only they're only public charter schools, and so they have the same obligations to children with disabilities as a regular old public school does. Okay, I lived in Arizona for a number of years, and there was uh, quite a bit of charter schools in Arizona. And I think at one point they had the, num the highest number of charter really? schools in their state. Yeah. Oh wow! Um, but I imagine that that is an obstacle, making sure that as new educational opportunities arise, that they're also held by the same standards for the rights that are, mm -hmm. are need to be given there. Um, <clears throat> so you're seeing more charter schools coming into Alabama now? There, um, only a tiny handful have been approved so far. Yeah. Um, uh, you think it's beneficial? Do you like charter schools? Um, I'm a public school proponent. Um, I believe in the civic value that comes from having a strong public school system. Um, I am concerned that charter schools um, might siphon money away from the school districts in which they are placed. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, they meet the needs of some families. And as long as they're serving children with disabilities, our responsibility is to make sure that they're serving them properly. Mm -hmm. So we have the same um, goal with them as we would a regular old 
public school. It doesn't matter from your standpoint. If you're sir, if you're providing educational services, it doesn't matter if it's private, public, charter. Well, private is different. They don't. Private schools don't have to follow, for instance, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. But the public school system does. And if you are a child made eligible for special ed under the IDEA, whether you're walking through a regular public school or you're walking through one of Alabama's charter schools, you are entitled to the same free appropriate public education. What does it look like for a private school? That's um, on an individual basis there? It's just a, based upon the essentially the goodwill, I guess you'd say, of the private school yeah. as to whether or not they're going to meet the needs of any given particular child there who might have a disability. Okay, <clears throat> at this point I know we've had a little bit of latency issue. I'm going to open it up uh, to the chat and see if there are any questions here. If you have a question um, specifically about IEP transition, um, mm -hmm. some of the, the child uh, children's advocacy, advocacy team, if you would like to <clears throat> text it in the Facebook chat at the bottom of this video, I will scroll through right now and see if there are any questions. Also, if you would like to talk uh, on air, you are more than welcome to call in. And I'll put the number here. And you just remember, you will be live on air. And we'll give it a few minutes there and see if anyone would like to do that. You see any uh, comments there, Jessica? <laughs> Our audience of um, one. <laughs> that would be um, okay, so do you advocate for people with disabilities that aren't receiving medical services or medications or procedures for medical stuff? Do you get that? Are they being denied a service because of their disability? Okay. Like, is there something? No, I would just think that like they're entitled to like seeing a specialized, um, you know, like a physician, a specialized physician, and it's not being covered. If they, cause they're, they would but that's not. So, so here's the here's the thing: if they're being denied a service related to them having a disability, in other words, the dis, there's a discrimination against them because they have a disability that's when we would step in. If they just can't get an appointment with the doctor because the doctor's chock full of patients and you happen to have a disability, there's no discrimination there. You're just one of many people who can't get in. What if like Medicare, which is federally funded, isn't reimbursing for medical services that they need? Okay, so if, um, if Medicare or Medicaid is denying a person with a disability a particular service, mm -hmm. let's say it's incontinent supplies or some sort of DME supply or maybe private duty nursing, right. um, that is, if, if a caller contacted us and said this is happening to me, we would do sort of an initial, initial assessment as to whether or not that person did in fact have a right to that service and had been improperly denied it. Um, and then as I said earlier, um, if we can, we're going to empower that person with ideas and strategies about how to go about fixing it themselves. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we might take that on as a case. We do that a fair amount of time on the children's side with Medicaid, um, just because the Medicaid mandate for children, um, or the Medicaid program for children, is such a robust insurance program um, where basically a child if there's a service that is deemed medically necessary with you know some exceptions around the edges um, then the child is supposed to get that service I have a question what if um, what if the state's not able to, pro to provide the resources for that service like let's say that somebody needs um, to be in a group home or needs services for that and the state just says we just we, we don't have any more money we we don't and there's nothing we can do to provide that service as there are people on the waiting list that mm -hmm. aren't being serviced that should be serviced so how does that work like if you 
So yes, the state, you need to provide these services. The state, can they just say, well, we can't? And then what's their next step? Well, so the waiver services are unique in that, um, I'll give you kind of a 10 second sketch. Yeah. Um, so the way the Medicaid system is set up, essentially if Medicaid, when a state accepts Medicaid, it promises to provide a basic uh, menu of services to everybody who's entitled to them. Medicaid waivers, literally, the way that they're structured, they exempt or they waive a state from, from following many of the normal requirements of the Medicaid Act to allow a state to serve a particular subset of people. So there are, what, six or seven waivers now? Two, six, I guess the six ID, or seven. The LAH, the... The E&D waiver, the, the ID waiver, the living at home waiver, the, the ACT waiver. They're, so each one of those waivers is set up to serve a particular population and to serve them with a specific set of services. Um, and in doing so, the state can say to the, f in, in the grand bargain between the state and the federal government, the state can say, we're going to limit the number of people who can receive, let's say, E&D waiver services to X number of people. I don't know what the number is. Um, so yeah, there can be um, people who arguably could be eligible for the E&D waiver, but because the state can limit it to a certain number of people, um, there are the waiting lists. So if the state does waivers, they can limit to a certain number of people that they provide those waivers to. But if they didn't have waivers, they couldn't limit? But they wouldn't provide the services either. That doesn't make... So the federal government says, okay, we're going to give you this money, and the state says, okay, we're going to provide services, and then the state says, but we're going to decide to provide services through waivers, and those waivers allow us not to serve some population. I think if, if you look at the basic menu of services that the Medicaid Act requires every state to, be, to provide, and Alabama has the most bare bones Medicaid program in the country, the services that the waiver provides are all about keeping people with disabilities in their homes and in the community. They're, they're not you know, they're respite services, they're behavioral therapies, they're um, assistive technology services. Um, so in crafting these waivers in order to keep people in the community, um, the state, yeah, can limit the number of people that receive the service. Um, I almost feel like they kind of fall through the cracks if they're not clearly defined by the service. What do you mean by that? Like if, um, like, uh, I believe there's not a waiver for autism right now in Alabama. There is not. So that would be something where... There's a big old crack there. Yeah. Yes. And so if you're is. not clearly, if you don't clearly fit into these waivers, then y you have to do quite a bit of work. Yeah. And uh, But I, I think that's the purpose behind a lot of the rethinking and the restructuring that... Um, the state is going through right now um, to rethink how its waiver programs are set up and who they're set up to serve and what exactly are they doing. Mm -hmm. Are they are they serving um, as broad a population in as um, uh, sensible and, and fulsome a way as possible? Mm -hmm. And that's tough when you break everything down into services. It's yeah, it's tough, you know. Yeah. So I, I feel for both the state and for the people. Mm -hmm to come together there. I'm interested to see what happens in the next few years um, with the uh, final rule being implemented by 2020. Um, oh, the, the, the home and community-based settings rule? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of really cool things. I'm excited for the leadership that I see in the state, um, and I think that it's going to be a very good thing for the community in the next few years. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Hopefully nothing happens to the services that my uh, uh, family Your members. loved one is getting, yeah, Exactly, yeah. or I'll be yeah. fighting. So. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, I didn't see uh, uh, the connection kind of mess us up there. I didn't see any comments at this point and no call-ins. So I'd like to kind of wrap up here um, at this point and ask <clears throat> if somebody is watching that is 
in high school or just out of the education system and starting their community living or their family member, what would you like to say to them? Let me take your question and change it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Instead, let me talk to the person whose child is just getting into high school. That's perfect. Um, we, some of the hardest phone calls we get are from families where the children are getting ready to graduate and they, the families feel like they're graduating to nothing, mm -hmm. that they're about to fall off a big old cliff. Um, and so a tremendous amount of our advocacy um, is devoted to serving families of younger children, you know, the middle schoolers, the early high schoolers, to make sure that, that, that they don't encounter that cliff, that there is in fact a smooth transition from school and being at home with mom and dad to young adulthood, where, whether it's employment or whether it's um, post-secondary schooling, and hopefully maybe some kind of independent living maybe not right away. Uh, awful lot of 19 year olds with or without disabilities still living still at home with mom and dad. <laughs> so. um, but eventually um, uh, that that takes place. And so we really want to encourage families to, and it's hard to do it um, because life is chaotic. just, is chaotic. Um, but really start thinking earnestly about transition planning early so that, that you're not falling off that cliff at the end. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of resources out there um, that can help you um, get ready for that transition, yeah. including ADAP. Awesome. Do you guys work a lot with um, special education uh, coordinators? Um, we do, and I'd like to think that it isn't always acrimonious. Um, uh, I. I think, um, yes, we do. We've gone in and done trainings for school staff. That's what I would imagine is, you know, sometimes they have questions and maybe they're reluctant to open up, but I didn't know if you did trainings for that group of people. We do, we do. Tra our, basically our motto when it comes to training is if you give us an audience, we're we'll, there. We'll be there. Whether it's an audience of parents or service providers, social workers, uh, VR counselors or school staff. And that's part there. of the outreach that you guys That's do. part of the outreach. Yeah, that's one of the, the, the key mechanisms by which we do our work mm -hmm. is doing outreach. And again, it gets back to that self-advocacy thing. Unless you know the law, unless you know the resources, you can't be a good self-advocate. Mm -hmm. So going out and doing that training is a big way that we get that work done. Yeah. And if, like the Full Life Ahead Camp, I think that's a great weekend for families that you know, because that, uh, the, some of the people that go there, their kids are just starting high school or in right. middle school, and I think that's you know, a great thing to get involved there and, and learn. So And very empowering to families and to the youth, like I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of fun, too. I enjoy it every time. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been in about a year. i got to go back. I keep getting people, are you coming to this camp? And it's like, it's been crazy, not right now, hopefully yeah. next camp. So uh, hopefully get back out there in February or in the summertime for a camp. But Okay, at this point I'm going to wrap it up. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for watching. This video will be edited and available on YouTube for sharing. Um, and at this point, I'd like to thank Mrs. Anderson for being here with us today. So well, thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate you coming out to Tuscaloosa. Yeah, well, I was uh, good to come down here. I guess roll tide, I got to say, on campus. Thank you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we well, see the stadium is, is two buildings that way. It is indeed. We overlook it, yep. Yeah, very, I imagine it's crazy on game day. Uh, yes. In fact, in fact, uh, we um, are encouraged to get out of the parking lot as soon as we can so that the out-of-towners can come see, in. See, I would kind of want to get up on the roof with binoculars to see if you could see a little bit of the field. From this building? Yeah. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. It's too, too no. low. Yeah. 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 The angle's not right. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs>